Who remembers the Commodore dataset from the 80s? Curious about how data can be stored on audio tapes? I built this miniature version. This little cutie connects over USB and can store and restore files on tiny microcassettes. It's perfect for saving C64 games. Loaded from tape! How it works and what disasters I had to overcome, you'll find out in today's episode. As a kid, whenever I visited my cousins, we played C64 games. These were usually stored on regular cassettes. Now, almost 40 years later, I'm revisiting this old pack again, this time with a focus on the technical side. I was curious if I could manage to store and restore data on audio tapes. At first, I wanted to make another ridiculous M.2 device using tiny microcassettes from dictaphones. So I got the smallest voice recorder I could afford on eBay planning to reuse its guts for my project. But once I had it in my hands, it really reminded me of the Commodore dataset. That's when I decided, why not just make a micro version of it and connect it to USB. Using a microcontroller, I could try to trigger the buttons electronically and use analog digital converters to translate audio into data. I started by carefully disassembling the device, trying to keep the process reversible in case I wanted to restore it later. The recorder had a remote plug that looked like a non-invasive way to control it, but it didn't support fast forwarding or changing the play direction. No, 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 wait. I want to stop it. I can only forward and record. I kept taking it apart, which required desoldering some components. Wow. It was a marvelous little piece of tech. I attached wires to the button pins and figured out how it worked. All right. Since it normally ran on a single AAA battery, I used a DC to DC converter to drop the USB 5 volts down to about 1.8 volts. Haha, <laughs> turns on. Let's play. From here, I discovered that the button lines just needed to be pulled high to trigger. Twice it reverts, you can see the lever will switch. I used a simple voltage divider to drop the 3.3 volt signals from the microcontroller to the recorder's lower voltage. I even used my RISC-V cluster programmer to test it. Next, I had to handle the audio. The microcontroller had an ADC, but no DAC. I have used R to R resistor letters in many projects. They need a lot of pins, but they are simple to use. So I grabbed an unused prototype PCB of my magnet tiles, soldered in a resistor letter and wired the ADC to the speaker output and the DAC to the microphone input. Frankenstein. <laughs> Testing live on stream, it was tricky at first. Now, rewind, stop. Fast forward works. And record. Record doesn't work. A testing deck for the first time. Nothing. The deck signal wasn't great, but it worked well enough for a proof of concept. It's a little bit off. Play. Once it was running, we tested the recorder's frequency range, which turned out to be best between 400 and 4000 Hz. Encoding data into an analog signal can be done with amplitude phase or frequency shift keying. Amplitude shift keying changes the signal loudness, phase shift keying shifts its phase and frequency shift keying changes its pitch. I started with amplitude shift keying by turning the carrier frequency on and off. By using multiple frequencies simultaneously, you can even encode several data streams at once. Like playing different piano keys with the sheet music being your data stream. Beethoven himself achieved a decent data rate this way. During our tests, it even sounded like simple melodies when incrementing binary numbers. But although it looked and sounded cool, I couldn't encode more than about 50 bytes per second. It also required a Fourier transform to decode on the microcontroller and it was sensitive to tape speed variations. The original dataset on the other hand used frequency shift keying, a base frequency for one and double that frequency for zero. This way just one wavelength stores a bit. It can only store one stream at a time, but the density is much higher and decoding is far more efficient. Once I had a working proof of concept, I designed a PCB with everything I needed. A 16-bit DAC or optionally two 8-bit ones, 
op amps as buffers for ADC and DAC, voltage dividers for the controls and even a small prototyping area for future add-ons. After assembling it, the DAC output looked much better, okay. but the op amps I used were garbage. Why? Oh, what is this? I swapped them for basic LM258s, which worked perfectly. Oh yeah! Then it was time to design the case resembling the original dataset and 3D print it. I even got filament in matching colors. Making everything fit mechanically took several tries and the project already dragged for months. Yikes, please don't break. At one point during repeated assembly and disassembly, the flex PCB connections broke. Play doesn't work, I need to find broken connection there. Yeah, these are certainly broken here. That was soul crushing. Some people say I should seek therapy because I constantly put myself in frustrating situations like that. An easy way to get therapy can be done through BetterHelp. They offered me this paid partnership to advertise their services. Experiencing mental challenges is a part of the human condition. While I personally can overcome my frustration with my projects and fix them eventually, there have been situations in my life where a single session with a therapist was enough to resolve internal doubts. Especially when I struggled with university, it helped me to get back on track. The therapist somehow asked the right questions so I could find my answers from a new perspective. But there were also times where I struggled and wished there was an easier way to get a therapy spot. In case of emergencies, you should use emergency lines, but in other cases it can be really difficult, especially if you are struggling already. BetterHelp is on a mission to make starting therapy easier. You just fill in questionnaire and you will be matched with a therapist as soon as possible. Easily switch therapists anytime at no extra cost if it's not the right fit. With over 7000 reviews and a 4.3 rating on Trustpilot, BetterHelp is a platform you can trust. Click the link in the description or go to betterhelp slash bitlooney and get 10% off your first month of therapy. With the broken traces now, I had only two options. Repair it or buy another device. I did both. Luckily I found a second one on eBay, so that's why I can film both devices at once now. Repairing the first one meant tracing 34 tiny connections and soldering hair-thin wires. That made the project irreversible, but at least it worked again. It works! With that done, I switched to frequency shift keying and analyzed okay. the results live on stream with some browser tools. We used a specific sync by to mark the start of a packet followed by encoded data. Decoding was done with a discrete Fourier transform. Since the phase was aligned, we just multiplied the samples with sine waves and summed them up for one wavelength to measure power. Whichever frequency had more power determined the bit. But there was a problem. The type speed varied, causing sync loss during decoding. The first 6 bytes are right, then 7 bytes, 7 bytes is broken. I added a compensation step that adjusted the phase by a few samples after each byte, realigning to the strongest signal. It worked, but recalculating powers for each acquired sample was too expensive for the microcontroller. So I simplified further. Instead of multiplying sine waves, I use square waves with plus minus one, which just reduces to adding and subtracting samples. Even better, I kept running sums, so only the newest and oldest samples needed to be updated. This was fast enough now to work in real time on the microcontroller. To improve reliability, I expanded the sync marker to the actual word sync, preceded by a silence gap. <laughs> 512 bytes! <laughs> I also added a 16 bit CRC for error checking to the end. At 1500 Hz, errors were too frequent, but at 1000 Hz, it became stable enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. In this first test, we were able to store and restore an 8 kilobyte image of Pac-Man and even play it afterward. Let's see if it loads. <laughs> it loads! That was amazing. It works! <laughs> this is the first thing that, that I ever loaded from tape. I never played Pac-Man before, like this original Atari version. Bigger files fade though. Can't tell. 
Let's see if we can load it. Star Wars. Nope. So I split them into 512 byte chunks and stored each separately, with a progress bar showing chunk status that was reported back to the host during the process. If one failed, the tape would rewind and retry. Still, bad chunks couldn't always be recovered. It seemed it was always the same chunk that failed. Error. So either there was noise during recording and error. or the tape is flawed. So I added a simple hack. Just store each chunk twice in a row. The chance of both copies failing is extremely low and it finally worked flawlessly. Sure, it cut the data rate in half to about 500 bits per second, but it was worth it. Oh yeah! <laughs> My next step will be to make it appear as a mass storage device and maybe store an entire C64 emulator with games. A full 60 minute tape can hold about 1 megabyte of data, though it would also take 60 minutes to load. For now I'm really happy with the results and everything I learned along the way. Yes, it runs Doom. <laughs> I hope this sparked your curiosity about old tech and maybe even about signal processing. Subscribe if you want more projects like this. Thanks for watching and huge thanks to my supporters. Your contributions let me go the extra mile. See you next time. Bye.